and uh, welcome everyone. I appreciate you spending uh, uh, some time to learn about uh, cyber insurance and cybersecurity. Uh, my name is Doug Kreitzberg. I'm a founder and CEO of SeedPod Cyber, uh, and uh, uh, for many years uh, uh, ran uh, in insurance programs and affinity business for a large national broker uh, where we develop programs like cyber and insurance. And uh, when I just turn it over to Eric with HRCT and Steve, they introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Eric with HRCT, Vice President here. I uh, operate and run the IT services division and uh, I've been doing uh, IT services for small and medium business for 26 years. Uh, half of those have been spent at HRCT. And Steve? Yeah, Steve Ramos here. Um, I started off with uh, working in healthcare. So I used to support uh, a large pharmaceutical company um, and moved on to some smaller uh, companies still in the healthcare business. And uh, now I work uh, as the business technology manager here at HRCT, uh, mainly as a uh, uh, an engineer, network engineer for uh, cybersecurity and network architecture. Right, great. Right. Thanks, Eric and Steve. Uh, it, and uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of walk through a little bit about uh, what we'll be presenting uh, today. Uh, we'll, I'll be starting off really talking about what is cyber insurance. Many of you may know that know what it is, but just want to make sure that. Uh, that, that we all understand uh, uh, what this type of coverage is. Uh, we'll then talk about kind of what, where the market is for cyber insurance is today and what's kind of led up to that uh, as, uh, as the changes in the risk exposure has evolved o over time. Uh, and then we'll talk about, you know, where, where the losses are coming from and from, uh, from the carrier standpoint, how they're responding to those losses, yeah. and what you can do uh, as a potential insured to put yourself in the best position uh, to get the best pricing and terms uh, available. And as part of that discussion, we'll really go into depth on the technical control aspects um, because a lot of what uh, – what was nice to have from a technical standpoint is now kind of table stakes uh, for for if uh, with regards to the cyber insurance uh, underwriting process, uh, and then uh, certainly through this, uh, as as Kathleen mentioned, uh, if you have any questions or any comments, feel free to drop them into the Q and A section. We'll try to get that to them as we proceed, or or at the end of of the presentation, uh, and and. Uh, I just want to kind of start out saying, uh, you know, um, one of the reasons that, that uh, I founded uh, SeedPod uh, Cyber is is because the the insurance market is has been grappling with how to deal with cyber risk for for a number of years now, and and one of the year, you know, when when we used to sell it, when I used to sell it uh, at, at my previous role. Uh, you know, we weren't getting the take-up rates that I thought that we should. And when I talked to the prospects, there seemed to be two reasons why uh, they they weren't buying. One is they didn't understand what cyber insurance was and what it did and why they needed it. Uh, and uh, so hopefully we can kind of address that here. And the other is they really didn't know how to think about cyber risk. They they had someone in IT. They figured they were on top of it, and they also felt that since they weren't Target or Home Depot, you know nobody really cared about them. From you know the bad guys really wouldn't wouldn't touch them. That certainly has has changed. Uh, hopefully the perceptions have changed as well uh, over time. But one of the core things that uh, that I did in in, in creating SeedPod is make sure that we would address the insurance side, but also help organizations address the security side, what they needed in place. And the way that we do that is we work through partners like HRCT who have the expertise, as, as, 
you know, you'll, you'll hear, uh, and also the products and the solutions to present and to work with their customers. Uh, and that's the model that we think works best. It helps us be able to provide the most competitive uh, pricing, and, and it also improves the security posture of, of, uh, of the clients, uh, both for HRCT as, as well as for ourselves. Uh, but but let's just jump in and, and talk about what cyber insurance is. So the, so the formal definition is cyber insurance covers you, the business, in the event of a malicious or intentional act that impacts the confidentiality, integrity, or accessibility of your system. Uh, and, and what that basically means is that it covers you when bad things happen to your system or your data that harms others or harms yourself. And we'll go into a little more detail uh, uh, here. Now let's just talk initially about the bad things. What are the types of incidents that, that typically uh, are covered uh, under a cyber insurance policy? Well, the first one is, is a data breach. So when, and that's when someone gets into your system, they're able to uh, get into the data and they may take the data or at the very least they have the opportunity to look at it. And this data could be confidential, could be information on your clients, could be healthcare information, could be financial information, uh, but it, and it could be even uh, uh, intellectual property if you're a law firm uh, working on in cases like that. Uh, so that's what a data breach is. Another type of incident is ransomware. Uh, and ransomware has really exploded over the past few years, especially uh, during the time of COVID when organizations began working uh, from home and uh, it really expanding what's called the threat landscape, making it easier for the bad guys to attack. Uh, and ransomware, for the bad guys' perspective, is a quick, e easy payout uh, uh, there. And, uh, uh, and then... Uh, kind of a combined, you've got the ransomware data breach sandwich here in which uh, uh, the bad guys will get in, they'll, they'll take data, uh, they usually encrypt the system uh, as well, and then they'll hold you up for ransom both to get you know your, your access to the system back, but also to get the data back or, or the bad guys won't allegedly... Uh, 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 spill the beans on, on the data that you have or that they, they've they taken from you. Um, and then uh, another type of, of uh, incident that's covered under uh, cyber insurance is e-fraud. And e-fraud uh, has a number of different uh, uh, definitions within it or categories within it. Uh, one would be invoice manipulation fraud. So when the bad guys get into your system, they're, they send uh, fake bills out to your or to to your clients uh, and asking them to pay to another uh, uh, with with different banking instructions there. So that's one example. Another is social engineering attack, where someone may pretend to be the CEO, send a note to the controller saying, "Hey, I'm in a, going into a business meeting." To close a major deal, I need 25000 wired immediately to this bank number. And it wasn't the CEO, and it wasn't uh, uh, a, a legitimate uh, uh, banking account there. Uh, and and there, there's other types of uh, business email compromises, as it's called, that kind of fall into this category. So whether you're talking about a data breach, ransomware, e-fraud, these are the types of incidents that give rise to, to a, a claim. Uh, and, uh, and, and when, when they occur, the insurance covers a number of, of areas. One is lawsuits. So if in a data breach situation, if uh, they take uh, health information as an example and uh, uh, the patients feel that they've been damaged, they could file lawsuits against you, and and this would uh, cover you uh, in the event of that situation. 
Uh, a, a related area would be regulations. Uh, it, to follow that example, if, if HIPAA or the FTC uh, or a regulatory entity took uh, action against you, this is uh, the area that, that uh, the cyber insurance would, would cover. Um, the middle category are the costs incurred. These are the costs that you have to pay for once an incident happens. It's the cost to identify what that incident is. So the forensics costs, as, as they're called uh, uh, there, it's certainly the cost to mitigate and, and stop the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, whatever incident uh, and, and try to segregate it uh, uh, to get your systems back up and running. That's all around incidents response. It's the cost to send out those breach notification letters and or credit monitoring. If you have a, if you have a data breach, uh, cost to repair, restore systems, data, et cetera. Um, these are the, the costs that you need to pay uh, here. And, and then there's the lost profits that you may suffer uh, in the event that you're down for a prolonged period of time or don't have access to your systems for a prolonged period of time, and that's causing you to either not able to do business or causing you to hire additional staff or additional capabilities in order to maintain the business, and therefore you're losing profits uh, over that period of time. And I would say from a claims perspective, the bulk, the majority of the claims are really in that cost incurred category and the lost profits category. There are lawsuits, certainly, and you hear about the big ones uh, uh, periodically, uh, but that would be kind of the, at the lower end of where the claims uh, uh, activity is. Um, that being said, if there is a lawsuit, uh, that can basically uh, eat up a lot of coverage uh, uh, in and of itself with the defense costs that are incurred with that, the time in court, if it actually goes to court, and certainly any settlement that comes out of it uh, here. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and just to give a sense for, for we're, we're really of what the average costs are um, uh, here, and I focus on funds transfer, ransomware, and lost profits, and, and you'll see why momentarily. But uh, th these are average costs for a small business, uh, and this will fluctuate over, over time. But uh, you know the funds transfer costs, so the cost of that uh, to an organization is around two hundred thousand dollars if you suffer one of those attacks. For a ransomware attack, you basically there's a wider range from three hundred to one point eight million, and the reason it's the wider range there is is because. Uh, ransomware can be nipped in the bud relatively quickly if you have the right security posture in place, or it can be a prolonged period of time, uh, uh, and you, it, may, it may involve uh, uh, having to pay the ransom to get, uh, to get your services back up and running there. And then the lost profits, as I talked about, the average there is around $800,000 uh, in, in lost profits. So, you know, as you're thinking about if you don't have cyber insurance today, you know, you may want to think about, you know, your ability to recover from any of these. Is this, uh, are these numbers uh, a, a drop in the bucket or would they be, be represent a material hit to you? Um, the other, the other, um, there's a, some other costs here that, that I haven't shown, but it's also worth mentioning is, you know, reputational cost uh, uh, is also a factor, and there is some reputation coverage built into a lot of the cyber policies. Uh, but that's that's something that uh, it's tough to kind of put a number on it, at least from an average standpoint. But uh, you know, if you do have a, a attack, will your clients stay with you? Will it make it harder for you to acquire new clients, uh, or even uh, uh, you know? Uh, even thinking about the, the employees and the staff there. Um, so that's another cost to think about as you're deciding, you know, whether you should have cyber insurance. Talk a little bit about where cyber insurance is today. Uh, uh, and it's gone through really over the past, I would say four years, uh, a sea change in how the, 
the carriers are looking at this. It, you know, five years ago, you could buy cyber insurance, uh, uh, you know, and the, the application would have been one page. It would have asked you if you have a firewall and some other bits of information. And uh, as long as you had a firewall and could write a check, not necessarily in that order, you could get the cyber insurance coverage. Uh, um, today, it's a lot different. Uh, today, the, instead of one-page forms, there's multiple pages. Uh, instead of one question on technical controls, there's a lot of questions uh, with a lot of weird acronyms uh, as part of it. And often, you have to turn around and give it to an organization like HRCT to help you complete uh, there. And the reason that that's occurred is really uh, due to the trends in, in the claim activity. Uh, and this is a chart uh, that shows from 2015 to, to last year, both the growth in premiums, so that's the green bars, as well as the uh, changes in the loss ratio. The loss ratio is the percentage of claims divided by premiums. And so when the loss ratio is high, as you can see it uh, starting to slope up in 2018, reaching a high point in 2020, uh, that means that the carriers are uh, taking a hit to their profitability. And as it gets up, up where, uh, you know, in that 72% range, uh, in fact, some of them are probably losing money at that point. Uh, and and what you know, and we'll talk a little bit more. But one of the things carriers do in these situations is they raise their rates, and so that's you can see the big jump in the green bars in the last two years, where rates increased 154 uh, percent, and that drove down the uh, the loss ratios. So it could get back to profitability. So and for any of you, and you may have seen this with your own coverage, if you had coverage, is that you you know you may have been paying uh, fifteen hundred, two thousand in in premiums in two in two thousand nineteen, and you might be paying four to six thousand, or much much larger depending upon uh, the size of your organization. Uh, here, this is really uh, uh, you know a function of that uh, of those losses. Now, one thing to note, the the way that the loss ratio went down was more a result of carriers increasing premiums than it was the risk going down. So in other words, ransomware hasn't gone away. Business email compromise hasn't gone away. Data breach hasn't gone away. And in fact, now you, you are, you know, with artificial intelligence and and other uh, capabilities that the bad guys have, it's it's certainly not going to be going away. If anything, it may accelerate over over time uh, here, and and so that's going to take a um, uh, that from from the business standpoint. What that means is that you need to be continuing to look at your secure environment uh, in order to maintain either insurability or to maintain uh, uh, certainly uh, decent pricing. Um, here are the current coverage triggers. This actually came out of a report from, from at the end of last year. Uh, the top types of loss um, include kind of those e-fraud coverages. So the funds transfer fraud, uh, where the bad guys got in and they were, uh, they were able to uh, uh, transfer funds to or send, send transfer orders to transfer funds to to their accounts and that business email compromise which could be invoice manipulation or other types of uh, uh, social engineering related uh, attacks and then ransomware so these are the three uh, top types of losses and whenever I speak in person to groups Invariably, if I ask if anyone has had a ransomware attack, or has anyone, you know, had uh, uh, some type of uh, funds transfer fraud, invariably someone will raise their hands. Uh, and you may know our organizations that have suffered this uh, personally as well, if you haven't suffered it yourself uh, here. And the the key loss factors are are important to keep in mind: phishing. 
Uh, certainly that's where you, you know, someone clicks on a fish, they give their credentials, uh, but it's not to the IT department. They give it to, to the bad guys and then they are able to access your system. Unresolved vulnerabilities. So software, uh, as you know, in some cases, a uh, piece of software is written, you know, operating system as an example, it has some exposure that the bad guys have identified and they're using that exposure, that vulnerability to get into your system uh, here. And unresolved means is that it hasn't been, you haven't uh, changed or updated the software uh, to mitigate that. End of life software. So uh, at, at some point in time, the uh, software and manufacturers will stop supporting a particular version of a product and uh, that's what's known as end of life. Uh, and, and therefore, there aren't any, you know, whatever vulnerabilities were there are there now and no one is uh, updating them. And that, that creates a playground for the bad guys to, to get used to get into your environment. And then misconfiguration. Misconfiguration could take many forms. Often it's not setting the right security controls in a cloud environment, or it's not setting, uh, putting the uh, encryption on your, forgetting to put encryption on your laptop, or 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 not configuring uh, uh, your your servers uh, uh, correctly. There, uh, these are these are the key uh, loss factors, and I would just say three out of the four of them are due to human risk and human risk is the largest component of of uh you know the the cybersecurity vulnerabilities that we have uh and it's important to it to address those some of those you can address through solutions and uh hrc we will talk about that in a moment uh some of them you have to address through training uh and also how you view risk and treat risk as an organization that's what's called uh, governance so, the, you know, these are the loss factors that are driving the claims. And, and what do carriers do when they lose money? I talked about one, which is raising rates. The other things that they do is they lower the limits. So instead of being able to get 10 million in limits uh, one year, you may only be able to get five. And then the other thing that some carriers do is they say they exit the business. They say, no, Moss, I don't want any more of this. Uh, I've had enough. Check, please. Uh, and and there, therefore, you as the insured need to find so, uh, somewhere else to go for your coverage. And the one thing that they almost invariably do is they start paying more attention to the risks that they're writing. And that's what you're seeing when the applications have gone from the one page to the nine pages uh, here. They start asking a lot more questions. And <clears throat> just want to talk a little bit about broadly what carriers are looking for. Uh, one of the things they're looking for is business stability. Uh, you know, how long have you been in business? What's your, you know, churn rate, retention rate uh, with with clients uh, here? And some of them are looking at whether, you know, do you have a history of suing clients? Uh, because that may work against you in certain situations uh, relating to cyber incidents. The types and volumes of data that you have. Uh, if you're in healthcare or financial services, that's obviously you've got uh, uh, more valuable data and creates a higher risk. Uh, governance, how you're managing risk overall, as I talked about. Uh, the industry you're in, the revenue size, these are kind of the, usually the key components to start out in, in formulating a rate. The rates are basically based on they start with uh, revenue, they're adjusted by your industry, and then you take it from there. And last and not least, and this is really what's uh, evolved over the past few years, are the technical controls. What controls do you have in place? And, and we want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is very important uh, for you to understand not only you know, what, what security controls to help you mitigate your uh, mitigate risk, but also just to be insured. And so we have a number of areas uh, that, you know, we're calling it the basic insurability kit. Uh, and Eric and Steve are going to kind of walk through these with us, uh, help us understand what these are and, and why they're important. Eric? Cool. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Yeah, the first one on this list is multi-factor authentication. 
So single factor authentication is your password and passwords are often uh, lost and stolen by the bad guys. Uh, users are famous for not using complex passwords or using the same passwords across multiple systems. So how do we get around that? Uh, we introduce something that you have. Uh, a lot of times the easiest thing to use is your mobile phone. So yeah, I'm sure you've seen banks text you a code to get into your bank account. Uh, that's something you have, you have your, your phone with you. Uh, we like to put uh, uh, something called Duo on, on our clients' uh, networks, and that will way they log into their computer. Uh, Duo will ask them if this is okay, and they'll say yes, and I'll let them in. Steve? Great. You're on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so patching um, isn't, isn't uh, this isn't like a, a quilt. Patching is is meant for software, uh, where it, software inherently comes in um, and is is sold and distributed um, with inherent bugs. It's it's always an unfinished product. So uh, patching is is literally um, patching those those holes in the software, the the unfinished or unresolved issues um, we were talking about earlier. The um, uh, unresolved vulnerabilities in in software um, like Microsoft always releases patches at least once a week to um, resolve those those vulnerabilities that people find um, and then your your asset inventory is is basically the inventory of what you have in your network whether it's a computer a printer a monitor something that can be um, logged into um, you don't know what to protect if you don't know what you have. So you definitely need an asset and an inventory. It could it could be as simple as a spreadsheet, uh, but just keep track of what you have. Yeah, okay. for backup solution and data recovery. So one of the things that uh, will get you out of a ransomware attack is the ability to recover, uh, because ransomware is going to encrypt your data. It's going to make it so it's unusable. Um, so if you want to avoid having to consider uh, making that ransomware payment. Uh, you need to back up everything that you care about and test those uh, recovery solutions. Make sure that you can restore. I have multiple copies, have an online copy, an offline copy, um, so that you, there's always ways to get back the data. So everybody knows what a firewall is. Everybody thinks they know what a firewall is. Uh, it's usually a, a physical device that uh, separates uh, you and your, your network from the rest of the world and the internet um and that's exactly what it is but there's there's that physical firewall uh that you have on your network you also have um your uh windows firewall whatever firewall is 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 um protecting your your computer your computer or your workstation um they even have software firewalls to protect your um uh, cloud hosted virtual machines so the these are this used to be the the only thing that you needed to to fill out those insurance forms, but now this is a uh, uh, a staple in in network security. Next gen AV antivirus itself is is previous gen in my opinion. It's called endpoint protection now. Um, antivirus is definition based, so all it did was look up uh, like you look up a word in a dictionary. So. Hey, is this piece of software doing X, Y, Z? Does it exist in the dictionary? Then it must be a virus and let's stop it. Um, so next gen solutions um, have other, lots of other things such as, you know, being able to block USB drives, being able to block you from going to, to malicious websites, um, just for a few. Um, also anti-ransomware, um, anti-vulnerability uh, protection. So all those other, all those prongs and approaches uh, is what's going to help stop the, those things from getting into your systems. Um, email filtering and DNS filtering. Um, the, again, the one of the most um, used vectors of, of uh, uh, attack is email. So if if you don't uh, protect your email, you're you're probably going to get breached. The email filtering helps because then you don't have to see those um those malicious emails come in those phishing emails come in um the the uh the dns filtering is just another way of 
uh, protecting your your network. It's another layer of defense that really that really sits outside of your network where uh, firewalls and and other filters are category based. Um, this uh, DNS filtering contains a uh, block list of, of URLs and uh, websites that have been compromised and, and stops you from going to those compromised websites. Endpoint detection and response. So this is a service that is human led. It uh, runs out of security operations center. It's 24 seven. Um, and what these people do is look for um, indicators of compromise. Um, such as data expectation. So, for instance, uh, maybe, you know, Paul's computer is uploading the corporate database at three o'clock in the morning to Malaysia. Um, those guys are going to detect and respond and block and stop that stuff uh, while you're sleeping. So, you don't have to worry about those kind of threats. So, encryption is a um, method of, of, of cybersecurity that converts your uh, data from it's readable um, uh, format into something that some people some people can't read. Uh, you have to be able to decrypt you, this this format to to be able to see it. So um, when you're viewing a website, for example, you uh, want to protect that traffic, so you encrypt that traffic so that nobody can uh, attack the middle of that traffic and and receive it and read it themselves. Uh, same thing with your uh, your laptop. You want to uh, encrypt your laptop so that if you accidentally leave it in a an Uber or somebody steals it out of your trunk, they can't pull that hard drive out and just read what's on your hard drive. Security awareness training and phishing simulations. So the human element um, is always the last line of defense. So all these protections we're talking about are never 100 um, percent. You definitely need to train your employees how to spot what a phishing attack looks like, um, how to be wary of uh, people claiming they are who they say they are with social engineering. Um, and, and phishing simulation is a, a service that we offer that we can send uh, emails that look just like phishing and see who in your company is gonna fall for that and then send those people to remedial training. Uh, when people talk about cloud security, it, it's, a, it's such a, um, vast subject and it encompasses a lot of things. Uh, basically, anything that we've touched on today, the the firewalls, the multi-factor authentication, that everything that we talked about um, should still apply not just to your in-house uh, equipment, but also to your your cloud uh, systems. If you're using something like uh, QuickBooks Online or uh, some other SaaS solution, you still want to. Um, continue to use those uh, security measures, the the passwords, the the multi-factor, uh, all the filtering, um, you know, access lists. You, you still want to continue to use those uh, those principles of, of protection. Um, a lot of people also think that once once you're in the cloud, you're protected. Um, that's not always the case because um, there are certain settings that are default to make it uh, more convenient for you to use. But if it's more convenient, it's not always secure. So you want to take a look at your settings and make sure that all those settings are set to something that's more secure than the default. And finally, incident response plan. So if you do get uh, in a situation where there's an incident, uh, you want to have a plan and a procedure and you want to practice that uh, because the worst case would be all of your systems are encrypted. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows who to call. Um, and so it's good to define that and define the roles and then uh, have a simulation on what happens when there's an incident. Great, great. Well, thank you, uh, Eric and Steve. Uh, very helpful. Uh, uh, and uh, and every time I, I hear things, I pick up something new myself. Um, you know, one of the things is, uh, as, as you were going through it, is that uh, that I think about is is each, each of these uh, is is a discipline in and of itself in terms of putting in place, uh, making sure that uh, it's it's uh, set up properly, and uh, that that um, you know the and and that it's being checked to to make sure that it that nothing has changed over time. 
And, you know, many of you, uh, I would imagine on this call are already clients of HRCT. Um, so you already know that they can bring the expertise uh, in these areas to your organization. Uh, and I, I would, you know, at, uh, security in particular is only going to become more specialized over time, and I would lean on on uh, organizations like HRCT that have that expertise to help you. As I mentioned before, one of the big issues, cause of loss, is misconfiguration. So, so you want to make sure that you have someone who who can take the time, knows what they need to do, and uh, uh, in order to go go through that uh, there. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Eric or, or Steve, but uh, uh, that, that, you know, I think it is important to not only just have these things, but make sure that you're working with someone who, who can, knows what, what they're doing with regards to these. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you're just buying a product off the shelf, um, you, it's good to make sure you're talking with an expert that can actually set it up and configure it properly because, it could go really bad badly if you're if you're not doing everything in a secure fashion. Yep, yep. Uh, and then the uh, you know one of the benefits uh, of of having these in place and may, and that there are configured correctly is uh, uh, that that you have access to your, your first of all insurable and then access to to uh, insurance that recognizes the steps that you've taken to secure your environment. And that's where SeedPod Cyber uh, comes in. And we have uh, uh, two different programs that are available to uh, uh, clients of, of partners like HRCT. Uh, one is we, we call it our, our Cyber Express program. And this is uh, for businesses under $50 million in revenue uh, that it allows them to get a million, a million dollars of cyber insurance coverage for as uh, low as uh, 1775. That's an annual premium. Uh, plus there's about 3% taxes or fees. And that's available for businesses under 25 million. And for businesses between 25 million and 50 million, uh, the premiums are a little over $2,000 uh, here. And uh, the main requirement, there's a certain, there's certain industries uh, classes that, that fall into this, but uh, the main requirement is that you have those baseline security controls that we just review. And if you do, you can take advantage of this. And, and I would say that the premiums, depending upon where you are in terms of revenues, the savings can range anywhere from 30% to 300% uh, here. So uh, it's something that uh, uh, whether you have cyber today or you're being asked to have cyber by your clients, uh, you may want to look into. And then for firms that are uh, over 50 million in revenues or that have uh, uh, may require more than a million dollars in limits, uh, we have our SeedPod Cyber Plus. Again, because you're working with uh, uh, HRCT, um, you and and we're able to through that validate uh, where the tech stack that you have and the security controls you have. You know, our our uh, insureds have been saving on average 30% on those premiums, and the application process is is simplified uh, uh, as, as part of that. The other thing, uh, in addition, that we provide is um, uh, annual incidents response simulation. So we'll work with HRCT and, and you as an insured and just kind of, uh, you know, in a virtual way, it's, you know, walk through what would happen if a ransomware attack occurred. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that helps. So that type of preparation really can help uh, and, and mean the difference between being down for an extended period of time and and uh, not having all the resources in place to address an issue and being able to get back um, up and running fast and maintain discipline and order when the incident occurs. So uh, we feel that, that that's an important uh, uh, feature uh, that we have as, as well. Um, but that's, uh, that's the insurance side. Uh, you know, I want to thank you on behalf of, uh, um, and certainly I want to thank Eric and, and Steve for, 
for helping us uh, uh, in, in terms of getting this webinar uh, together. Uh, really appreciate our partnership with HRCT. Really, you know, our goal is is to make sure that uh, that uh, all businesses have the ability to compete and thrive in this digital age in a secure way. And uh, uh, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you about this. Uh, I don't. So that I don't know if there's any questions, Kathleen. Uh, yeah, we do have a couple questions um, if we have time and if any other ones come up from the audience we have um, here right now, then feel free to drop them in the chat and uh, we can get to them before the end. Um, but this one will be for Doug. Um, what happens if I've had a claim before and um, I'm trying to get cyber insurance renewed from a different carrier? Um. Thanks, and that's a good question. Uh, you know, just like if you had uh, auto accidents or or homeowners claims, uh, it the it, it's going to have or could have an impact on on your rate, and in some cases on your ability to get coverage. Uh, and we've heard of certain situations where the carriers have dropped, you know, dropped their insurance after even one claim. Um, prefer that 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 isn't the approach and that's not the way that we like to, to handle uh, the insurance that we work with. Uh, in the event of a loss though, um, the important factor is, is that you demonstrate that you've addressed the issues that um, gave rise to the loss. So if it was a ransomware attack as an example uh, that came through uh, a port, a remote desktop protocol, uh, uh, port uh, that that's been addressed and, and shut down, uh, or that you've em you've employed uh, uh, better security awareness training, and you have a backup system that that uh, you know is is encrypted and and uh, you know is is maintained offsite uh, so that you have a reliable backup when you need it uh, there. So we're again working with an organization like HRCT. To you know, review, do a risk analysis, up you know, make those changes, uh, go a long way towards keeping your rates down, uh, if not uh, getting coverage there. So that's the main thing that you want to be able to demonstrate. Great, thank you, Doug. Uh, we did get a question from the audience just pop up. Uh, can the insurance structure be customized? Um, Sorry, I just lost it. Can the insurance structure be customized based on type of business and liability limits? Um, yes, the an the answer is yes, uh, and and uh, uh, both in terms of limits um, as well as uh, uh, the the coverage. Uh, uh, looking at at coverage enhancements too. There there may be certain things, particularly with regards to the regulatory um, uh, side uh, coverage. Uh, limits and and also uh, with regards to if you're in uh, manufacturing with regards to you know Internet of Things industrial controls etc uh, that you're going to want to make sure that are covered in an appropriate way and and uh, the we're we're able to kind of customize the coverages uh, and you know and the limits uh, uh, appropriately and in some cases. We find that that you know if the risk is more a risk of being sued than of uh, addressing those first party costs, uh, sometimes we'll have higher limits for the liability versus for the uh, those the first party costs, those costs that you you bear, uh, and and that's a way that some organizations do. Uh, one thing that's important is you know when you're evaluating this or you know working through this make sure that you're working with a broker or an entity that specializes in cyber insurance uh it, you know as as you've seen the you know just looking at the basic insurability kit uh there's a lot in there and uh and you know you have you have to know both the cybersecurity side as well as the insurance side now uh i think as as uh, an insurance professional in this space, 
and sometimes uh, the um, traditional broker just isn't as as you know uh, just isn't as up to speed on what's going on there. So just make sure you're working with a specialist. Great, thank you. Uh, we got another question. If you have a previous hack but no claim, are you still eligible for insurance? Um, yeah, yes. And and uh, so if you had an incident um, uh, and nothing, you know, there was no payout, no nothing, uh, you guys shut it down quickly. Uh, you you can you know that's usually not a barrier to getting insurance. Uh, now. If there was a claim that occurred as a result of that incident, why you had insurance, that claim would not be um, that most likely uh, not covered uh, there. But it, it really kind of depends on what you've disclosed and how the carrier would, would respond to that. Great, thank you. Um, if we have time, um... Do have one more. Um, can I still get insured if I don't have all of the required security controls in place? Um, you can get insured if you don't have all of the required security controls. Um, the, uh, uh, however, you're going to be subject to um, pricing, uh, and you're not going to get the best deal possible. And and depending upon which controls you don't have, you may not, you still may not be able to get the insurance uh, over, overall. You're going to want to have the multi-factor authentication. You're going to want to have the firewall. You're going to want to have the EDR in place. You're going to want to have the backup protection. Uh, uh, you're going to want to have patching uh, in in place. Um, you know, virtually every one of those components you're going to want to have um, uh, there uh, in order to, to be covered, though. So. Great. Um, I think the I think that's all the questions we had. Um, if Eric and Steve, if you guys have any you know frequently asked questions from your clients that you want to speak on or um, about insurance that you want Doug to answer, um, you can go ahead and bring those up. Uh, but I think we I think we covered a lot of information there. Oh, nothing from my side. This was great. Yeah, this is really good. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, great, great. Well, thanks, Kathleen. Again, uh, uh, again, thanks, uh, Eric and Steve, for allowing us to participate with you. Uh, we certainly value our partnership in many ways, including uh, the opportunity to uh, geek out on cyber insurance and, and cybersecurity. Uh, and most of all, thanks uh, for the audience for uh, 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 you know participating and being being present. And if there's any way that HRCT or SeedPod can help you, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks. And have a great day. Great. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Doug. Uh, we did get a question for. Uh... Oh. The team HRCT. Um, do you guys have the ability to do a complete forensic study if email has been hacked? Um, and can HRT, HRCT tell which side was hacked initially on the email, um, customer or company, by doing a forensic study? So we sense. don't. Yeah. So we don't have um, exactly forensic uh, credentials, but. We've been doing this a long time and we can definitely dig in and look around and see uh, we to the logs. I will say from experience, though, um, if your systems are not set up to send logs and archive logs and record all that activity, a lot of times there won't really be a lot of information. Uh, one of the products and services that we sell um, is the ability to crack down what exactly happens on your systems um, through audit logs and whatnot? Because even if you were to turn on all those logging and thing, logging information, weeding through it um, is nearly impossible and finding that data. But uh, there's some tools out there that we use that will send all those logs into a database repository 
uh, sift through them, bring all the relevant things to the surface, allow you to search and report and all that. Uh, but again, that's something that you would have needed to have in place prior to the incident um, to really get the most value out of. So hope that helps. Okay, anything else, Kathleen? Nope, I, um, I think that's all from the audience right now. Um, I can leave the chat open for a couple minutes afterwards, and then uh, you can always email any questions to the emails on the screen, info at seatpodcyber.com and sales at hrct.net. Um, and I can, you know, if there's any questions in the, in the next couple minutes, I'll make sure they get to the proper team member and you hear back from them. Awesome. All right. Great. Well, again, thank you so much. Appreciate All your right. time. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks again. Take care.